Welcome, FBCG family. Over the past few months, Pastor has been taking us through an intense and thought-provoking deep dive into different books of the Bible. We started out learning what it means to live out loud in the book of James, and then we learned practical principles from the book of Philippians and what it means to overcome personal prisons. And that leads us to what we're discussing now, a deep exploration through the book of Galatians and what it means to be justified. From the earliest moments of our childhood, we are taught the Pledge of Allegiance. That pledge ends saying, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. While that pledge likely raises much concern given the current climate of our country, it's the pre-word just that stands out the most. Ah, the scales of justice. The thought-provoking balancing of various sides different opinions and ebbs and flows that helps us to make the decisions that will guide who we are and what we will become. While living in what seems to be an unjust world, being justified seems to be unreachable. For a believer, giving too much weight to what the world calls right can easily have you on the wrong side of God's justice. Thankfully, we as believers give more weight to what the word says. Even when the opinionated pebbles of the world's point of view seem to tip the scale in the wrong direction, it is the rock of God's word that corrects the scale for us. It's how we live our lives and thankfully, we have a pastor who drives home for us the importance of allowing the word of God to guide our lives. Tonight is a dialogue between pastor and people, an opportunity to dive into the minds of FBCG believers and examine their own thought patterns, examine their own pebbles of opinion one by one and challenge us all. It's just that real. It's just that raw. It's just what we need. It's justified. This is the conversation. <laughs> I really love God, man. And one of the things that makes me, and that baffles me the most about him is the fact that he can know everything that we deal with. He knows everything that we put ourselves through. Even the things that we may be ashamed about that we don't want to always be vulnerable with him about. But he takes that as an opportunity to love on us. That's why we should never be ashamed when it comes to him because he knows already. But the fact that he even came down to down a cross for all of our sins just shows how much he cares just about every, every area in our lives, even those areas that may even seem gray. And if he would have a favorite color, it would be your true colors. <laughs> if you're excited about that as much as I am, just gives you another opportunity to just worship him just for who he is and so I wrote this song that just says he loves the gray Shattered and contrite 
to my surprise it is what you desire the true shades of my heart you'll never despise and I don't have to hide who I really am the one you came down for I'm the one who needs you the most with your arms open wide my true colors are why you chose to die hanging there and all Display. Your love was red, but it covers my gray head, my gray because you love the green. You love the gray, you love the gray, my gray, you love the gray, my gray, you Welcome back, family, and thank you again, once again, for hanging out with us tonight. Please be sure to share this link with anyone that you know needs to encounter God, and be sure to drop in the chat and tell us where you're joining us from. Be sure to ask questions throughout the night so we'll be able to take them up to our pastor and get your questions answered. So without further ado, let me introduce the FBCG believers here to engage in our conversation with our pastor. We have Minister Chris, Pastor KD, Stephen, Rashawn, Amber, Ernest, Latricia, Colin, and our incredible pastor, Pastor John K. Jenkins Sr. <laughs> pastor, thank you so, so much for hanging out with us tonight. We always love engaging in these conversations with you. So, Fun fact, Friday on a Tuesday, Pastor, I had said to Pastor KD a couple months ago, I said, I hope the next book that Pastor takes us through is the book of Galatians. And she said, Tam, the next book that he's doing is Galatians. I said, no way. She said, yes way. So I'm so ecstatic that you were all in my business because I love the book of Galatians. I've just always thought that it was just jam-packed with so much power and so much revelation. But I wanted to know, what do you love about the book of Galatians? And why was this book significant to be the next book that we go through together as a church family? I didn't have a special reason for doing Galatians. Um, I think there's, you know, some specific things throughout Galatians that's significant. You know, the fact that he drives home that you are not saved or get a right relationship with God by obeying the law is a significant deal. I love what we talked about last week, Galatians 6, 1, that the heart of God is restoration, not punitive. So many churches 
punish people as opposed to looking to restore people. I love that about Galatians. Um, but I didn't have any special reason. Just uh, it was a book that I felt on my heart to, to, to do next. I'm so glad you did. I'm so, so glad you did. So to kick us off tonight, we live in an unjust world. As believers, we live in that. But how do we pursue a just God while living in unjust circumstances? What are some practical ways that we're able to do that? I think I shared in uh, the last book we did how there were saints that lived in Caesar's household. And the fact that um, God empowers us and gives us the grace to do what we're supposed to do, regardless of the circumstances that we live in. And so, um, you know, once you learn the word and you know how to apply it to your life, it's all a matter of applying in your circumstance what the teachings of the word are for where you're living. And so uh, we're trying to challenge and help people understand that that's what God's mandate is for you. No matter where you are, he will give you the grace to be able to do what you need to do. That's good. That's good. That's good. So family, again, please feel free to jump in and chime in and ask pastor questions because I'll sit up here and ask all the questions. On I'm tonight. jumping okay. in. Go ahead and jump in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jumping in. So pastor, what Tam said about it being an unjust world, how do, how do we then as believers encourage other believers who are starting to think that God himself is unjust because of all of the unjust things that are happening in the world. How do we encourage each other? Yeah, you know, this world is, you know, the Bible is clear that this is the domain of the devil. Uh, the prince of darkness uh, is controlling, influencing, and uh, he might be able to um, uh, influence people to make bad choices. He, he has, not he might. That's what he has done. He has convinced so many things to go on that are just the opposite of the will of God. But believers need to know that we are called to hold up a higher standard. That's the thing I want to talk about is God's standard. His standard is so much higher and we're called to be submitted to that higher standard. When people think that God is unjust, what that means to me is they don't understand the nature of God. They don't understand the theology of who God is. And it's our job as believers and as the church to do our best to help people better understand the nature of who God is and what God does. And so that's that's why we have churches. That's why we have classes. We're trying to help people understand the purpose behind pain and drama and circumstances and try to help people understand that it's not a question of God's unjustness. It's the fact that God allows us to have a choice to make the decisions that we want to make. Uh, and I think uh, it's sad that so many people are subscribing and believing what the enemy says and are willing to do what he suggests when God wants us to make different and opposite choices than that. I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, that's that. good. That's real good. And I think you really hit on something about not understanding the nature of God. I really think that's, you know, that that's really good. And maybe we don't really understand it ourselves. If yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a side of God that God will never force him. See, he's such a gracious God. Yeah. He will not force his will on anybody. Yeah. He will not make you do anything. He will not force people to do right. He won't force you to do right. Because we are human beings, he gives us a choice. We are rational beings and we, we have the ability to make rational choices. And so he never forces us, but he gives us the opportunity to choose. So, Pastor, can we stay there for a second? No, so, we're done with that. Th okay, I'll say <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, Pastor, you, um, you speak of the high standard that we are called to bear. Um, so I'm one of the members of the J.U.J., the Jacked Up Jokers Club. J.U.J.? And so when we feel like we aren't, from whatever mistakes we've made in the past or uh, whatever we have going on, whatever personality flaws, when we feel like that we aren't worthy to carry that high standard, how do we get over that hump? The fact is, ain't none of us worthy. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You, you, you know, we don't make choices. Here's something I would like to drive home with people. We don't make choices in life based on how we feel. Emotions, unfortunately, has become a thing that has driven so many people that they make decisions and choices based on what they feel. 
And at some point in your journey, you have to recognize that God is a God of principles. You learn the principles and you apply those principles in your life and you don't make choices based on what you're feeling. That's what gets you in trouble, making choices based on how your flesh feels. Your flesh, your flesh, flesh. your nasty flesh, flesh never wants to do right. It always wants to choose to be the opposite of what God's will is. And Galatians talked about that, about here's the works of the flesh. Here's what the flesh does. And God has never called us to go by that. So my, you know, my push, my push to people is never go by, never make choices or decisions based on how you feel. Make decisions based on principles that you've learned and be consistent with applying those principles in your life regardless of how you feel. So may I ask a question in reference to that? So um, very often young people come to me and because God is a gentleman and he won't push anything on you. So when they're praying for the right boyfriend or girlfriend or they're praying for, you know, what it is, it, it is that they want, how do they know the difference? They ask this. How do they know the difference between if God's just allowing them to do what their heart desires or if God is leading them in that way because they don't want to make the wrong decision. They do want to walk in his will, but they're confused as to which is which. Yeah, one of the greatest things we have to teach people is how to hear the voice of God. How do I hear from God? How do I know what God's telling me to do? Um, I have a series in our bookstore called Hearing the Voice of God. It's 10, 10 ways God speaks, 10 different ways. Uh, you know, did we, did you can learn hear different ways God speaks. And then, you know, there's also a, uh, a message in that series that talks about um, the characteristics of God's voice versus the characteristics of Satan's voice. Because there are characteristics of God's voice and there are certain characteristics with Satan's voice. And then there's also a message in that series that deals with um, uh, reasons God will stop talking to you. What are, the, what are the things that will make God stop talking to you? And so I would encourage all of our young people here today. Let me see. Let me look around. There's all the young people here. If you haven't heard that series, I would challenge you to get it and learn those different ways that God speaks, how to know what God's characteristics are, what Satan's characteristics are, and what, what will cause God to stop communicating with you. And teach that to your young people. Teach them. You know, teach them how to hear from God, how to hear the voice of God, how God communicates. That's what they got to learn. My heart is for us to teach our young people how to have a relationship with God. And that's a part of having that relationship with God. Amen. Yeah. Pastor, question about, I'm sorry, who'd I cut off? No, go, oh, you can go no, ahead. You go ahead, girl. You go <laughs> ahead. Go oh, ahead. I was just going to say, I appreciate all of that. And I've listened to the series. I think it's fantastic. But it's hard when it feels like the world is so noisy. I feel like there are so many things that um, are intentionally, and it, it obviously is the enemy, trying to keep us distracted from things. What are some, some practical ways for us to just to find the quiet? It's hard finding the quiet sometimes, even when I'm trying to meditate, when I'm trying to pray. It's, it's, and I know some of it's training too, but what advice would you give other young people? I hear a click, 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 click. Turn that TV off. Turn that music off. Right? Can you do that? Absolutely. <laughs> but, I, but that's the thing. I, I do. I, I feel like it's a, it's a constant battle sometimes because I have been trying to be more intentional about what I'm feeding my soul and what I'm feeding my mind and what I'm feeding my body. But sometimes it just doesn't seem enough. And sometimes it feels like a, a battle. You, sometimes you feel, and I don't know if anybody else feels this way sometimes, mm -hmm. but you are actively really, really trying, but it's hard. And sometimes you don't feel like you're and getting And you know through. why it's hard? You said a key word while you were talking. You know what it was? What? Feel. Mm. You kept saying about how you feel. Some days I don't feel God. Wow. I don't, I, don't, I don't wake up in the morning and feel like praying. Not the pastor. I, <laughs> it, I, I wish I, I wish I could tell you all that I woke up and felt like doing all the right things wow. every day. Yeah. I do not. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. helpful because we, I think sometimes we feel like, oftentimes in Christians, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier, there's this perception of what life is supposed to look like. This is what it becomes when you, be, when you accept Christ. This is what it looks like. And it's none of those things that you think it is. And it's almost like it's a, another battle you have to prepare yourself for, but nobody really prepares you for that battle. So that's part of the challenge. 
it doesn't look as good as, you know, people make it sound. I mean, it's great. I'm not saying that it's not, but it's hard. And, and, and what we have to do, and I, I, I wish I could figure out a way to teach people how to stay in this lane. Um, the scripture says we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't go by what we see. Uh, I look at um, over the course of my, my time here as a pastor, when we were in the ministry center before we moved to the worship center, all of the challenges we had, all of the difficulties, people striking and all that stuff and um, not working on our, pro uh, on our project for various reasons and all these issues. And I learned in that circumstance how God showed himself strong. And I learned then you cannot go by what you see. We walk by faith. We get the word from God and know what God has said to you to do and what he believed. And we walk by, you know, walk by uh, don't walk by sight, but walk by faith. And the same thing with the feelings. You cannot go by what you feel. Your feelings cannot be trusted. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. You can't trust it. You cannot go by how you feel. So a lot of times I don't feel like a whole lot of things, but I, make, I don't make choices by how I feel. I make choices by principle. So, Pastor, how do we keep our young people? I have two young sons that I try to keep encouraged to not act on what they see or how they feel and you know sometimes they, they they keep it going and then sometimes they come in they're discouraged they're um, bothered by things they see in the world what, what would be your advice for that you know I think the biggest thing we can do with our kids is give them opportunities to see God and teach them how to look for God you know all of my kids um, have had some situation in their life where they saw God respond to them. I remember when uh, my oldest daughter, I won't call Sarah out by name, <laughs> uh, was going to, going to college and she got recruited by a couple colleges, Georgetown and Maryland, namely, and her, her parents wanted her, me and her, and her mama, wanted her to go to Georgetown, but she wanted to go to Maryland. Why? Because it was the party school. So she went, she took, she got went to Maryland and at the end of that year she saw that is not where she needed to be but you have to let kids you know release them to, to, to do what they want to do or whatever and they learn you 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 try to point them to in the direction they should go and you try to sh help them pray for God to show himself strong so when she decided that Maryland wasn't a place for her and they released her that next day the school her parents wanted her to go to, Georgetown, offered her a scholarship the same day that she got released. And I can think about all of our kids has some kind of issue, like some kind of challenge or trouble or problem or something that bothered them, that they wanted to, they wanted to know that God loved them and God cared about them. And God, you give God, you give kids the opportunity, you highlight it for them, you pray with them, teach them how to pray, look for God, I promise you, you don't have to search, God will show himself strong. Use those moments for teaching opportunities. So when they come home and they say they can't believe what's happening in the world, it's a teaching moment and opportunity. But at the same time, teach them how to pray and trust God to show himself strong on their behalf when they need God to do something for them. That's, good. That's yeah. so good. So, Pastor, quick, quick question in regards to challenging doctrine. When you are a believer... And there's different situations and circumstances where you want to unapologetically defend your faith. How do you do that without engaging in intense debate? How do you do that without it going left and people yelling and you hindering a, a relationship? How do, you, how do you do that, defending your faith and it not leading to intense debate? Yeah, I, I, I'm a discourager of, of Christians debating with people. You don't win people by debating. I think I said on one of the previous conversations, I'm challenging our people. Don't debate. We don't have to debate people. You pray for people who don't believe. You intercede for them. And in the, in the secret times when they face a crisis, you be the person that they say, you know what, I can call Tamara or I can call you, call whoever you might be, and say they can help me. So just love on them. Don't, don't debate people. I, I, I've, I have been so long, I don't even debate people. You don't have to believe in the God that I believe. I know who he is. I know what he's done for me. I ain't going to try to prove him to you. 
I'm not, I'm not going to debate you on that matter, but I know what God means to me. I know how it really is. And if you ever want me to share him with you, I'll share him with you. But I don't debate with people, and I discourage us from debating with people. I love that. And I wanted to bring up, a lot of times we talk about, we ask for advice for our youth. But very often our youth, I'm just going to be real, our youth don't want to, I'm going to say, come to church because they feel like the older people who love God and who know of God's goodness and have known of it for years are mean and snappy and their tolerance is low and judgmental. And so um, although we are often teaching our youth what to do, how do we remind our seniors that they need to exude the love of God? It's a never ending job. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to teach that all the time. And, uh, but you know, uh, children are going to have to learn to deal with mean people on their jobs. And mm -hmm. no matter where they go, they're going to have to learn to deal with it. And, you know, I'm not excusing anybody from being unkind. The Bible, Galatians talked about how we ought to treat each other. We talked about that last week. You know, um, we're trying to challenge and teach people to do the right thing. But here's, here's one thing I learned, Trish. Look, Trish. Um, hurting people hurt people. Yeah. People who are hurt try to inflict pain on other people to hurt and I've learned that and so when I come across a situation where there's somebody who's hurting people I try to look for an opportunity to find out what 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 happened to you that made you so nasty and so mean or to treat people like that why did you treat that person like that what happened to you and and then hopefully be able to minister the love of God to them and hopefully they'll have a different mindset with how they treat people pastor and really quickly in talking about hurting people hurt people I think we all know there's this weird kind of dichotomy between hurt and church hurt. What encouragement can you give someone who has experienced church hurt so much to the point where they stop coming to church or it may have completely impacted their faith or every time they hear about Jesus or hear about Christianity or hear about the church, a place where they loved and took refuge in, it's... I'm over it. How, what, what encouragement can you give to someone? You, you know, life, this is, what, this is one of the rules of life. This is one of the journeys of life that you're going you're gonna to be hurt by somebody. It's, just a, it's a part of the journey. You can't escape it. Somebody's going to do something, say something, not treat you right, talk about you, lie to you. It's just a part of life. And you have to, you know, people who, who don't learn to deal with hurt will get stunted in their growth. You know, they'll be, they'll be hindered. In, in what they do. People are going to hurt you all over. The church, work. Uh, I've been hurt in the grocery store, but I still go to the grocery store. Teach. Huh? That's yeah, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. You, it's, it's, a, it's the reality of life, and you just got to learn to deal with it and move on with your life, and don't let them stop you from doing what you know is the right thing to do. Yeah. You don't quit your job. One time I was working, a, I was a teenager, and I was working for the school system. And this, this girl on my job did something that hurt me. And so I got mad and went over in the corner and sat down and stopped working. <laughs> and the supervisor came up and said, what are you doing? I said, so-and-so did so-and-so and so and so She said, you don't work for her. She don't pay your paycheck. You, you know, and I learned, this is my teenage years, I learned that I can't let what somebody else does stop me from doing what I'm supposed to do. And that's what I would say to people. You don't, let, you don't let what somebody else does stop you from doing what you know God has called you to do or what your assignment is in life. Grow up, mature, and go forward and recognize what you're supposed to do and do what you're supposed to do. Pastor, I got a question. I want to go maybe in a little different direction. All right. And be, you talked about restoration. On the prelude, Tam read something about justice and injustice and God's justice. We live in a culture now, though, to where we can see injustice, whether it's abortion rights, whether it's civil rights, many different rights, as opposed to black and brown people. So I'm asking for my neighbor to my left and to the right, or for the audience member who's not here, can the church still show God's restoration or the heart of God when we're, we're split in the church, amongst churches, because you see the, if you're a conservative, the view is far to one side versus God's side. How does the church restore that? 
Man, you said so much in that question that, that, was good. that uh, I don't even know where to start with what you said. Um, you know, there, there, there are, God has a truth, period. There is truth. And some people are extreme in their truth to the right, and some people are extreme to their truth on the left. But right is, what God's truth is, is God's truth. And what I'm trying to do at the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden is teach people what the truth is without being extreme one way or the other. So I'm not really sure, because um, you talked about brown people and white people and black people and abortion and gay rights, and you talked about the whole stuff. So the churches in America have failed to disciple people. And that's why we have such wayward beliefs among church people, because the church has failed to disciple people. And that's why that's the vision of our church, is to disciple people. So you got all these church-going people who are on all these different sides because the church has failed to do what the church has been called to do. And it's unfortunate. Uh, yeah, the church, the church has been called to, to establish God's kingdom on this planet. That's what our assignment is, but we have failed. So um, I'm I'm, I want us as a church, I can, only, I can only talk about what I have influence over. And what I try to do is get the people that I have influence over to make choices in their life and for them to go to their families and go to their communities and seek to implement as best they can within the sphere of influence that they have. It may not change the whole world, but we'll see if we can change the little corner that I have influence with. Am I answering your question? You are. So as the body, how do we begin to have, I guess, more candid dialogue about our lives, what's happening, so that we can get to the place that we're actually walking this thing and not just talking it? Well, that's what discipleship is. That's exactly what discipleship is. Getting in those relationships with people in small groups. That's why we have these small groups, small discipleship groups, and we have cell groups and all of that. In those small groups where you are held accountable, that's the big bird word for the day is accountability. Mm -hmm. That you have to answer to somebody. The difference between a class and discipleship group is in discipleship you have accountability. You, you have to, you learn a lesson, you go back home, try to put it in place, put it in place, come back to the discipleship group the next day, or the next week, I'm sorry, and give an account of what you did in that, in, at home. Did you work it out? Did you do what you're supposed to do? Did you, did you love your kids? Did you take your wife to dinner? Did you read your Bible? Did you do what you were supposed to do? Uh, and if you didn't, you have to answer to all of those other people in the class to say, well, why didn't you do it? How can we help you do it? Has in a class, you're just going to just get the information in a class, which they may not hold you accountable in a class, but in a discipleship group, that's the key thing that helps change culture is discipling people. Wow, that's good. Can I jump in right there? I, because, because we had this conversation before, and y'all don't act like you don't remember, but we talked about how, how, how can, when we talk about this thing about accountability and holding one another accountable, how do, you, how do you hold somebody accountable without judging them? Yeah. Now, we talked about that, like, because a lot of people, the minute you try to point out what the Bible says, even if they're Bible carriers, oh, you judging me. Don't judge me. The Bible say don't judge. So how do we balance that, the concept of holding somebody accountable versus judging them? Yeah, I'm not, you know, the word judge, Matthew 7 uses the word judge. Judge not that you be not judged. The word judged means to make a dis decision about a person without facts. That's what judge means. I'm making a decision and I don't have a fact. But if I'm sitting in the class and you said, here's what I did, that ain't judging. Hmm, that's you, you just, that's a fact. You just said what you did. And we're challenging you. That's not judging. Now, if, I'm, if I look at you and, and, and make a statement about you and I don't have the facts about it, I'm making an assumption based on the limited things I see. That's judging. So, I, you know, I don't know what that term means when people say they judge, but that's what the difference is. So, first of all, let me just say I'm just humbled and grateful to be here with all of you beautiful people. 
and uh, I want to thank you, Pastor, as well. But um, I actually wanted to come back to something Minister Chris said earlier because I was thinking that was Minister Chris Cross because you Chris, Cross, Chris crossed me up oh. with that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a Breaking lot going anchors. on with it, but I, I think I know where he was getting at. And um, you thank know, you, brother. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and, glad um, you did because I don't know what he was talking <laughs> about. <laughs> And, um, you know, and I appreciate how in the Galatians 6 Bible study, Pastor, you were talking about um, you, you always come back to the fact you always humble us by saying we're the jacked up jokers and you're the president of jacked up jokers. And, you know, I'm a history and geography buff. And so I was looking back at Galatians and I was I'm always trying to connect the present to the past. And, you know, a lot of the folks in the Bible jacked up jokers. They're the original jacked up. Absolutely. Jokers. Yeah. And um, I appreciate the coverage of Galatians. Because as I was reading about the geography of Galatia, I learned that Galatia was East Central, uh, Central Asia Minor, which today is Turkey. Uh, and so I was thinking that they were, we were the jacked up jokers and they were the original jive turkeys. But uh, with that oh, being said, <laughs> with that being said, <laughs> 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 So my, my question, though, is, you know, Galatians, we talk a lot about justification. We talk a lot about um, freedom um, and how our freedom doesn't come from obedience to laws. It comes from our faith in Christ. We are free to love. We're free to serve. But I guess my question is, how free are we really? And can we take that freedom the wrong way? Can we take it too far? Can we think we're justified to do anything? And how do we know where to draw the line? I'll, I'll be very specific about this. I think sometimes as Christians, because we do have uh, a certain freedom and forgiveness, I've heard, and I'm, now everything I'm asking is for a friend, but I've heard, <laughs> I've heard a lot of people feel like, well, you know, we're forgiven and, you know, we're not being judged and God loves me unconditionally. And so, Folks talk about they can do anything, um, whether it's, you know, sexually, um, whether it's, you know, you talked about abortion and, you know, we could probably could explore that, whether it's drinking. Whether, I mean, there's a whole lot of sins that are talked about in the Bible that I think the question for me is, are we free to do anything? Do the laws, because we're free from the law, does that mean the laws don't matter? Where do we draw the line? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. And let me try to answer it this way. Um, God does love us. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. um, he does give us freedom, but it's freedom with boundaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, if you have, how many of y'all have, have had kids? Okay, when you have kids, um, you know, uh, they have freedom, but there's boundaries. There are limits to where they can go. No, no, don't come in the kitchen and touch the oven. You can come in the kitchen, but don't touch the oven. There's boundaries. God gives boundaries. Um, in Galatians, it says this. Chapter 5 says a list of works of the flesh. And then it says this. It goes through 17 of them, I think I said last week. And those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of, of God. What that says is you will miss out. You, you will miss out on what God has for you if it is a practice in your life. So if I go to the top of this building and jump off, God will forgive me, but I'm going to die. <laughs> well. I mean, I'm not going to live. Right. Um, he gave me the freedom. He gave me the freedom to go to the top of this building. Did he want me to jump off? No, he did not. Does he want you to practice and do wrong things? He does not. But there are consequences. There are penalties that go along with that when you disobey God's commands. So our, it is unfortunate that so many people think that the forgiveness of God allows you just to uh, uh, use the grace of God in an inappropriate way. God never intended for us just to do whatever we want to do. No, no, there are boundaries. Okay, so can I jump in? Um, excellent question, thank you. So very often I've had um, people to come to me of all ages and say, you know, on this hand, Christians say you can't do this, you can't do that because you'll miss heaven. However, they've been raised with um, the Romans road uh, and also John three sixteen, which says, 
you know, if you believe it, then you shall have everlasting life. So to them, they seem like it's saying two different things. So their answer is, well, what is it? On one hand, you're telling me as long as I believe this, that I'll have everlasting life. On the other hand, you're saying if I do this, that I'll miss heaven. So which one is it? So uh, and, that's, and that too is a great question because ultimately, um, if I have a relationship with God, I want to please God. Now, now this is, this is, I'm glad you asked this question because this is, a, this is a serious deal. If I truly have a relationship with God, I'm only going to go so far if I have a walk with him. Um, if I know him and have a relationship with him, I want to please him. I'm not going to just continue down a path of disobedience to God because I want to please God. I am, I am persuaded that if you uh, claim to have a walk with God, but yet you, you stay in a path of disobedience to him, then you're not really truly saved. Pastor, can you can I, go, ahead, go, ahead. go ahead. Okay, okay. Let's just go there. Okay, so go, we just... Go, oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 So we just... We, we already did. We already did. <laughs> so we just celebrated Pride Month, okay? The America celebrated Pride Month. And so um, many of us have friends that um, we know go hard for God, like love God, love God. Yet, and still they'll let us know that they're still having problems with their identity. And so, and then they're told that God doesn't love them and that God hates them. And so many of them are suicidal or confused and things of that sort because of the things that they've been told. Yet they know how much they, you know, run after God and love God. Yet and still, you'll see in the church, the church will use their anointing or use their creative gifts and turn away from that, you know, ignore that part. But on the other hand, say that God hates them. So it's kind of like a mixed message because you'll see people in church working di diligently that have made it clear. Am I making sense? Yeah, the church, you know, the church has done a terrible job with how we've treated people, let's say in the gay community, for, ex for example. We've, we've done horrible. Some years ago, I, 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 along with other pastors, made a public apology to the homosexual, lesbian community, but we've done a horrible job with how we have responded to them. What they're doing is no different than the, the adulterer just sitting right next to you in church. It's, it's all sin. He's pointing to you. Yeah, and so we, we, have a, we have a responsibility to love them and treat them um, uh, and, and teach them you know, so uh, I think I said a couple of weeks ago, our job is to love on them uh, and teach them the word of God until God helps them see their ways, regardless of what the sin is. That's, that's what we do every week. We try to teach people truth, teach the love of God, that whatever your issue is, and everybody got an issue, and you got an issue, and you got an issue, yeah. and you got an issue, and... I have like 12 of them. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody got an issue, and so we're, 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 God's cleaning us up. The sanctification process is a journey. Yes. One of our ministers, Minister Deborah Barr, was in a marriage to a woman for 18 years. But during that 18 years, she went to a church where they taught her the Word of God. And, and one day, they recognized the errors of how they were living, and she came out of that lifestyle. And that's how, that's how it works, and that's what God wants us to understand. Teach truth, wash them. If my hands are dirty, if I put it underneath the water and just run water on it, eventually my hands will get clean. And so that's why we're trying to, every Sunday, what I'm trying to do is preach out the Word of God and let it wash people like it's the water of the Word and help them get, get their lives straight and clean. It's, it, takes, it takes a while, and it's a journey. So we shouldn't tell people that, that God hates them. We shouldn't tell people that they're hated or whatever, they're going to hell. We teach them the word of God and wash them with the water of the word. And God in his time will sanctify them. And we leave that up to God to, to work on them to do yeah. Hey, Pastor, I had seen that interview um, that uh, uh, Reverend Barr had shared. She shared with group chat. And in that, there were two things that I had noted. It, one, she saw an example constantly modeled for her of love. Love in spite of the sin and not judgment. And two, it was grace. And those things. And that's pretty much what you've been talking about throughout the whole process of Galatians 5. You guys have what to say? I was, can I just piggyback? I'm glad that you brought that up 
um, just in general, and I appreciate Pastor's response. I think sometimes we are so quick, and a lot of people are so quick to, to say the church needs to do. We're the church. Absolutely. And so it's our responsibility to also set examples for other people on how to treat our friends. Mm -hmm. I'm very, I have friends that are gay. I love them the same way, but if I see someone mistreat them, I correct them too, yes. because it's not okay. Right. It's, it's just, I think it's, we're always looking outwardly and we're not looking at what we can do. We're waiting for pastor. He can only do so much, but right. we are also a reflection of him. Yes. So yeah. I think um, a lot of us need to look at how we are responding and supporting each other. So quick, so just a quick pivot since we done gone there, let's just go on ahead and just go on. Go all the way. Jump let's in. just go on in, just jump <laughs> on in. All there. right. As we know, you know, one of the biggest issues in our country right now is abortion and pastor, I definitely just want to, and I think, think we all want to do, just publicly salute you for just being so vocal, being so intentional, and taking um, your stance on, on pro-life. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, but as a believer, and I think it kind of piggybacks a little bit on what, on what Colin was saying, um, in terms of just where do we draw the line where you're in this country and you're expected to obey these laws, you're expected to adhere to these laws, but you're a Christian and, and, and in this walk and in this faith, there is a standard that is set, but how do you balance those scales? How do you deal with those issues when you are a, a woman and the country tells you you don't have a choice of your body, but you are a believer and, and you're, and you're pro-life? How do you handle that internal conflict of obeying the law, honoring the laws of the land, but also honoring the standard set before God. Yeah, you, you, the laws don't you, don't, you don't have to do wrong. The law might be wrong, you don't have to do wrong. You don't have to make the choice to, to, to obey the, a law that's wrong. God's standards and law is higher than any man-made law. And so we always bow to that law, not to the commands or the laws of people. So as long as the human law that is made doesn't violate God's law, I'm free to, I'm free to honor it and obey it. But the moment it violates God's law, then we don't, we don't subscribe to that. So um, my encouragement is, and I, I think you all have heard me say this before, I'm, I'm pushing and encouraging believers to run for political office and help incorporate the laws of God into the practices of what we do in our country. And I'm praying that God will help us be able to have that in our, in our country. Can I, can I, can I, can I jump piggy, piggyback on that? Because you mentioned abortion and that's definitely a big thing that came up with um, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, decision related to Roe v. Wade. But when you just mentioned what you just said about, you know, people going for office and things like that, how do you balance that against what people feel and even some Christians feel should be a separation of church and state? I've heard a lot of that, even from a lot of Christians that I have these strongly held beliefs, but those things shouldn't be decided by the government. They should, as maybe you were implying, maybe be individual choices by individual church members and that type of thing. At the same time, Roe was being struck down a couple of weeks ago. There was another situation that you might be familiar with. The University of Washington was a football coach who was praying, I guess, on the 50-yard line. And then they ruled, I mean, he lost his job over that. So there's people losing their jobs over this. Um, and they ruled that his termination was not constitutional because of religious freedoms. But how do you balance the, the separation of church demands that even some Christians have and even how do you realistically tell people that could lose their jobs for what they believe? Yeah, um, yeah I, I keep hearing y'all use a term that I want to try to kill. Okay. Y'all keep saying balance. Yeah. I keep hearing that balance. No, no, we, we're not trying to balance anything. Yeah. We are mm. Christians. <laughs> right. We are saved. We are on the side of Jesus and the word, period. I ain't trying to balance the I world. Think the balance is what gets us in trouble. Trying to balance yeah. two things is where yeah. we where we mess up. Yeah, we yeah. we're not trying to have one foot in the world, one foot in the world, and one foot in church. That's yeah. balance. That's balance. And that's yeah. that's good, get. Pastor. That's, but that's the reality. I ain't though, trying pastor, to do for that for most of us because I've always said this before. Now I don't know if I'm the only one who's a jacked up joker here, but there's always that struggle between the faith and the belief, and they're not the same thing. 
They're similar, but not the same. So my faith says, in one sense, I stand for God, for, you know, and I follow the principles. But my belief says, I believe that it may be okay in this instance, and I'm not going to put that out there because it might be for somebody else to make that choice, but it may be okay to do this, in other words. So there's a conflict, and it's two competing thoughts. And our job we... is to drive that conflict out of you yeah. and to right. help you get to the place of making the decision that's rock solid in obedience with the Word of God, period. That's what, I, that's what we're trying to do. So that's the sanctification process you refer Absolutely. to. That's constantly an ongoing thing. Ongoing thing. It's a lifelong okay. journey. Okay. Lifelong. Okay. So how do we get to the place where believers are the one that are doing, choosing, to the point that it affects culture enough to change people's hearts so that we're not trying to dictate the law of what people should do or not do, but they are being convicted by the Holy Spirit, they have relationship with God, and they're choosing different. Tell me the difference between setting man's law based upon God's standard versus holding believers and the body, us, accountable, you know what I mean, in our walk so that that's the life we live and it impacts culture versus trying to dictate the law. You just, you just preached the whole sermon right there. That's it. That's exactly what we're trying to do. That's what it is. We're trying to make a difference in the world, in the communities, in, in where we live, in the cities, in the, in the counties, in the states. That's the, what you just said is exactly what the challenge is. And that's what we're trying to do. So should our focus then be to, because you said run for office and things like that, so should our a part of our attempt be to change the laws of the land to match God's standards, or should we be changing the hearts of people enough that they're choosing different? It's not either or. It's, it's both. both and. Both, uh, yeah. It's yeah. both yeah. and. Yeah. Okay. And this and this and by the way, this idea of separation of church and state. Let me tell you something. We Every can't. law that is we made is based, based on, on somebody's truth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, somebody's yeah. truth. Mm -hmm. Somebody. So whose truth are we going to? Yeah. subscribe to. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's all based on somebody's truth. And yep. I, I, I have found God's truth to be the truth. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and I really think, I, I really think, Pastor, that sometimes we don't want to go through anything. So you mentioned um, in the chapter six of Book of Galatians that when you stand for God, absolutely, you're going to, be, you're going to get persecuted. You might get fired from a job. Absolutely. Like I did. I got fired from a job one time because I wouldn't do something that 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 was against God's standard mm -hmm. but the same God you know and I think is it that we don't want to go through anything of course that we, it, you know what has has we, has we see these issues coming up that the culture has loved on that the church takes a stand against it, it, we're reaching a time where people don't have to decide whose side they're going to be on mm -hmm. are you going to be sold out for Jesus or not Paul, Paul said in the latter part of Galatians, he said, I got the marks of persecution on yeah, my body. Yeah. I've been Ooh, beaten. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've gone to jail. Yes. We're getting to that place. So that's mm -hmm. where we got to be. We're going to have marks. to be at that point. Show your we're marks. Gonna, we're going to have to go there. Absolutely. So we, we, done had it e we have had it easy. Mm. Yes. But now we're getting to the place where you're going to have to make a decision. Am I willing to be crucified for Jesus? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel, all of them got punished. With Daniel thrown in the lion's den because he wouldn't bow down. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they wouldn't dance to the music of the king. Uh, and, 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 and they were willing to get, be, be killed, but yet God spared their life. But you might have to die. There are some of the early apostles, they died. They got killed. So, Pastor, we could have a really, really long conversation about the politics of faith. Um, but for a second, I want to step back off of that topic just a little bit because that's interesting, but it's a much longer conversation for me. I think at the end of Galatians, it talks about, um, Paul talks about how we are a new creation. And I get that conceptually. Um, in fact, I get that totally. However, as new creations, it does not mean we don't have a past. It doesn't mean we don't have habits. It doesn't mean we don't have memories that draw us back to wickedness. And so I can tell you as a born again Christian to this day, there are things that I've already done that it's because they were, I've already done those things. It's more of a battle to not do those things again 
than it would be if I never did those things in the first place. How do we deal with those challenges? And speaking for a friend, how does somebody, for example, deal with a lot of different sins, a lot of different sins that may draw us back to a, a darker place that frankly, we don't want to be in as new creations, as people who are trying to live righteous lives for Christ. Um, because it's easier said than done if we're being real. So your question is, how do we... I think you've already answered how, it. How, well, I guess... Sacrifice, right? The click, click. I, I think... Is there, is there, is it as simple as just don't do it? Or is it... There's nothing is simple it about harder it. than that? Is there, is there <laughs> tips? Is there strategies? Are there tactics that can make it more achievable to... To live holy. Exactly. Yeah, how do you live holy? Exactly. It's the, yeah. it's the million dollar question. <laughs> right, right, so, so right, Pastor, you, right. you talked a lot when I first joined. Uh, one of my favorite sermons that you preached was Leave the Honey Alone, right? You remember that sermon? Yes, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. my goodness. Leave and the family, honey alone. If, you have, if so, you have never heard that message, let me tell you something. Don't taste it. Don't touch it. Don't tweet it. Don't post it. Huh? Don't do well, it. might have to teach huh? that one again. Oh, my right. goodness. You might have to bring that back. But to, that get to, to get to Colin's question, question um i've learned to keep myself from around things that i know if, if it's honey over there and i know those bees are going to sting me when i get in that honey i'm Listen. leaving the honey alone That's i'm not it. i'm not going where the store that sells the honey i'm not <laughs> i'm not Come going on, on the website that <laughs> advertises the Wegmans? honey Don't right the store. <laughs> Ooh, but but sometimes the honey oh mm -hmm. my comes after you Ooh. Right. Ooh. So you got to be wise enough and smart enough to know that when that honey comes strategy. after you, you better this is honey, you I'm out. The fleet. Yeah. Right? What do so you, you, know you don't, don't have to up? answer honey's call. Damn. You don't. No, you don't. Uh -huh. You don't have to let honey in. <laughs> but I think that's the big You don't have issue. to respond to honey's text. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and I... And, mm, and yeah, all, right. all, I said I was asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... You get a little personal. <laughs> But I think sometimes we won't even admit that we really still like honey. And so we won't, you <laughs> right. know what I'm saying? We don't, honey feeds our ego. Yeah, like we, you know what? It make me feel like somebody, right. you know? And so I think that's how we can't leave the stuff that's alone the is we won't even always admit, I actually kind of still really, really like this. And I kind of yeah, want to still kinda. do it. And the, do, but the right? trip is, is that the honey was in something dead. Like, I'm going in she here, gone. the honey's sitting up here in this dead carcass, and God's, God's best for me is not going to be in something that's dead. Wow. It's not going to be in something that he, I'm sorry, I just get excited, honey, because that yeah. message, honey, that message. Because God's best for me, his promise, his purpose, his calling, the things that he's destined for me is not going to be in something that's dead. So when the honey calling and looking good, it ain't as good. And let me tell you something, they ain't as fine either. I'm sorry. No, All right. right. They ain't as fine. I'm sorry. Coming from a personal place, we got to move on. Listen. I don't know, Tansy. Don't tell me fine. But but no, but, <laughs> but again, if you all need to get that message, it was it was something. Go ahead, Amber. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say that's like I, it takes maturity. It takes time. Obviously, it takes. I keep going back to sacrifice. We talk about that and how challenging it is. It's not easy by any means. But I've gotten to the point where I ask myself, if it does not exude the fruits of the spirit, then I need to walk away. Whatever that is, if I'm not if if I'm not getting, and that's my that's how I kind of. And I'm not saying I'm perfect, far from it. Clearly, we're here for a reason, but it's, it's part of the process. It all boils down to making choices based on principles. Right, absolutely. And not how you feel or what you see. What you say, exactly. Go ahead, I'm sorry, I, I, I cut That's your That's okay, show. I was gonna say thank you so much for this because you know, when you're in marriage counseling, for those of us who are married, they always say, love is a choice you make every day. Like you don't wake up every day and be like, oh, I'm so in love with this person. But every day or every decision you make is, I choose to love this person day in and day out when they get on my nerves, when they, whatever, whatever, I'm choosing to love them. So I appreciate you reminding us that sometimes you don't feel like, I feel guilty if I wake up and I don't feel like going into devotion in the morning. But now I have to remember just like, I'm choosing to love my spouse every day, no matter come what may. I need to choose yeah. to you choose Jesus yeah. every day. Yeah. Yeah. Choose Absolutely. Jesus. Choose yeah. him every yeah. day. That is that is good, family. As we as we as we begin to go on ahead and, and wrap up this incredible conversation, give us one quick 
final thought, one big takeaway for you from the book of Galatians, from this incredible deep dive, this, this, this series that pastor has been in Galatians. Give us one last final point. Treat others the way you want to be treated. That's good. Expect persecution when you're standing for Jesus. Expect it. God is not interested in punishing you. He's interested in restoring you. Mm. Humble yourself. You ain't all that. Oh, you ain't nothing. You ain't nothing. You ain't nothing. You, you ain't nothing. You ain't nothing. Get it on a t-shirt. Yeah, that's a shirt. That's uh, shirtable. That's you know shirtable. What? I think mine is, um, we talk about reaping what you sow and you will reap in due season. But remembering that seasons change and that's okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah that's good. That's good. I think mine would be, Pastor was talking about, you know, when you wash your hands. And so each and every day, like we can't depend on yesterday's shower to take care of today's funk. So, Hallelujah. So every time, you know, you have to ask yeah, God. You did that. Bring it back. Bring it so every day, you know, as you're taking your shower, as you're washing your hands, asking God to continue to cleanse you of that that you don't want any parts of anymore. Wow. I think for me, it's the just being mindful and aware of the little things, the little leaven, mm. the little turns, because that we don't usually do it overnight. It's, it's the little turns that get us off of That's doctrine good. and That's truth. Good. So paying attention to those things. Wow. My, my, my takeaway would be my... Freedom is my faith. Um, I'm free because I believe. Mm, that's good. Pastor, final thoughts before you close us out. In I am so grateful for all of those who have, this panel of people who've come and asked me ridiculous questions. I'm so <laughs> proud of y'all. Our pleasure. I'm grateful for those who've watched us, watched us tonight. And um, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that even though our culture is hostile to God, our culture is rejecting the truth of God. I'm hopeful that God might bring revival to the United States of America and turn people's hearts around to say that, that we need God more than anything else in life. We need Jesus. I'm praying and believing God to bring a change. And so, listen, whoever you are, whoever's watching, I want to urge you, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, this is a great day, a great time for you to get right with God. There's a phone number that's right on the screen. There's an email address. There's a button that you can click on your computer. And it'll direct you to a place where you can get right with God. Where you can be free with the power of His presence. Where you can have a personal relationship with Him. I don't care how far you have fallen, how long you've been away, you can, you can get right with God. My prayer is for you to say yes to Him tonight. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.